Thank you, Sarah, so much for reading the passage for us. Uh, I do uh, keep that passage open, Acts chapter 2, and we're going to study those together. Let me first pray and then we'll study. Gracious God, thank you so, so much for your Holy Spirit, the gift of him, that we might have our eyes opened, that we might go from death to life in you. Speak now and open our eyes, unplug our ears, challenge our wills, change our ways that we may see you in all your beauty and glory and holiness. Amen. I never actually witnessed, I have never actually witnessed the beginning of a new era. My mother told me of the day when the Second World War ended. The scenes in London were of sheer joy, hope, happiness, dancing, singing, weeping with joy. Wrapped up in all the emotions was the sense that this was a new beginning. The past had gone, there was new hope. Now, one of the problems of a new era is that after an initial euphoria, the excitement just evaporates and disintegrates. Today, we remember Pentecost and the ripples of this event, rather than evaporating and shrinking, actually continue to go out further and further and further even to this day, 2,000 years on. Jesus Christ, ruling from heaven, poured out his Holy Spirit on the church. It was the birth of the Christian church, birth of the Christian era, and it is the beginning of what God is going to do until Jesus comes back to to judge the living and the dead. And Luke is very keen that this is not lost on us. Look at the beginning of chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost, this event, came. When it had came, when it arrived, if you like. Or another way of looking at it is when it was fulfilled. You see, this is not just a, a next stage for God. It's not a coincidence. This is now a very clear moment in history that the Lord has been preparing for. Look in verse 17, we get a glimpse of that. At the beginning, Peter begins his sermon by declaring God's plan. Look at it, in the last days, quoting Joel from the Old Testament. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. You see, the Old Testament is looking to this day, Pentecost Day. The people all gathered in one place. And it shows us as they have come, represents the purpose, you see, of the last days, that now is the mission to the world. They would receive, and then there we go. And what I want to do is to look at what happened on that day, And I want to show you three stunning supernatural events. Sound, sight and speech. All focusing on the uh, first four verses. But a spill over into actually the rest of the chapter. So here's the first thing. First, sound, the power of God. Verse 2. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. We need to be clear. We're told that it was a sound like the blowing of a mighty wind. It was a wind-like noise. The sound, the power of God, came as the breath of God. And again, this was an event spoken of long ago. In Ezekiel chapter 37, at the Valley of Dry Bones, dead people were left to waste. There was no helper and there was just these bones. 
It is a picture of devastation. It is a picture of the result of our sin, in fact. And what does God tell Ezekiel to prophesy? Well, chapter Ezekiel 37, verse 5, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. You see, the breath is the wind, is the spirit, same word. Then in verses 7 and 8, what are we told? So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in, in them. Verses 9 and 10. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to it this is what the sovereign lord says come from the four winds O breath and breathe into these slain that they may live so i prophesied as commanded me as he commanded me and breath entered them and they came to life and stood up on their feet a vast army it is a picture looking forward to the day when God will pour out his spirit and he will bring people to himself, back to life. There will be nothing less than a new creation. In the previous chapter in Ezekiel 36, God said, I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you, he says. And of course, it is a prophecy looking to this day, Pentecost Day. Luke wants us to understand with great clarity, this is the event that brings a new era. The power of God through the Spirit of God makes alive what was once dead. That event then has implications for us now. The coming of the Holy Spirit, you see, is not some extra experience to have. He is our life. He is our breath. Without the Spirit, we are the walking dead. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no spiritual life. But with the Holy Spirit, the power of God is present to make people alive. It's one of the great privileges of being a minister. To see lives transformed into greater obedience and love of the Saviour. Last Christmas at our carol service, we had several people giving their testimonies. And it was such a thrill to hear of lives that were dead, dry bones, but made alive as the power of God breathed life into them. As they testified to the rescuing work of Jesus. You see, God breathed life into them. So it was on the first Pentecost morning. A sound like wind signalled the coming of the Holy Spirit to make the dead alive, to make a new people for himself. And God has been doing that ever since. So there's the first thing. Secondly, sight, the presence of God. Verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them, on each of them. If the fire represents the power of God, sorry, if the wind represents the power of God, the fire represents the presence of God. And again, we need to be absolutely clear. clear. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, not actually fire. But the fire has rich symbolism that helps us understand the significance of the event. In the Old Testament, when God drew near to his people, there was fire. Moses with the burning bush. And on the mountain tops, the clouds of smoke, God descended in the fire and led his people through the wilderness. He did so with a pillar of fire. Now at Pentecost, the presence of God and the Holy Spirit comes on each person. 
God is a God of purity and holiness, majesty and beauty. The fire of his presence, you see, is not just a heartwarming experience. It is the revealing and exposing, consuming fire of his holiness. So here is the Holy Spirit when he takes up dwelling in our lives. His presence comes to us. He brings the purity of God with him. So we become the temple of God. Now, if there is compromise of disobedience in our life, if there is tolerance of impurity, if there is acceptance of sin, what happens? This puts us directly in conflict with the God, with God and the Holy Spirit. You see, the fire of the Spirit burns away our impurities as we turn from them. If we hold on to them, we will drive the Spirit away from us. That is why repentance, whether private or corporate, is so important. The Spirit has come to create a new community and we are meant to be marked by the burning presence of God and his character. He has not come to make us happy. He has come to make us holy, which will, of course, be our true happiness. We're to be, we're to be the place where, of God's dwelling. He has not come to make us good people, but to reveal himself and his salvation and our life together will be marked by integrity, holiness, purity and love. Can I just say, if you're a young Christian watching this morning or watching now, I think this helps us to explain why true Christianity takes such an uncomprom uncompromising attitude towards sin. It is because of this, sin is the exact it is because of this, sin is the exact opposite to the Holy Spirit's work in us. Because sin is an attack on, on the glory and the majesty of God. But the work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, enables us to see the vanity of this world, the emptiness of our idols, the slavery of our ambitions, and the beauty and purity of Jesus, who has come to die for us, and to take us to be with him. Let me put it this way. The mark, of, the mark that the Holy Spirit is alive in you and at work in you is that you hate sin and you long for God to purify you, to cleanse you, to make you whole. And whenever you have sinned, you have the humility from the Holy Spirit to face the truth to ask for forgiveness, to seek his grace and long for ongoing cleansing. That's why I think the fire follows the wind. Once the spirit raises us to new life, he puts life into us, he breathes that life into us, the new life progresses as we are cleansed, purified, as we live to serve Christ. It was the experience of the people who first heard the sermon, who, who heard the first sermon of Peter's in chapter, if later on in chapter 2. They heard him speak, and what did they then say? Verse 37, when the people heard, heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter says, Repent and be baptised inwardly have a new heart outwardly show the world you've changed and in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins he says then thirdly speech the purpose of God verse 4 all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That's the first thing that happens to them. So the wind 
represents the power of God. The fire represents the presence of God. And speech represents the purpose of God for his people and through his people to the world. In the Old Testament, the Holy, the Holy Spirit would fall on a prophet or a king and he would speak God's word. He would bring to bear God's purposes, commands, onto his people. And what is happening here is the Holy Spirit has filled the people and they're speaking in a tongue which is not their mother tongue. And that's what's going on in verses 7 and 8. You see, so the Egyptian, so they speak Egyptian to the Egyptians. They speak Arabic to the Arabians. It's not a miracle of hearing, it's a miracle of speaking. They were amazed and perplexed because the barriers, you see, have been swept away. The point is this, the new community that God is creating by the Holy Spirit transcends racial, national, linguistic boundaries. They've all been broken down. The plan of God to spread his good news to every corner of the earth is now the work of the Spirit. That is what he is going to do and he will do it through his people. The reason the Holy Spirit comes upon us is that we might be engaged in the mission of Christ to the ends of the world. Now that is remarkable, isn't it? That the first thing that happens when the Spirit comes, the first thing, God's people speak about the mighty works of God. Do you see that at the end of verse 11? We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. The wonders of God. What were the wonders of God? What did Peter then speak about in that first sermon? The life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Do you see? How God creates his, this new community as his spirit fills his people who tell of his mighty deeds. Others hear and believe. So here is the birth of the Christian church. Here is the birth of the Christian era. A whole new way. And God is creating the most wonderful, unique community in the world. This community will be a place for his power, his presence, and his purpose. And from there, to be the source of all blessing and hope. Every Christian church should be the source of this blessing and this hope to the world. We're meant to be a church in this line. The event, of course, itself is a one-off. But the effects continue and have continued in every generation since to today. How might we press this home? There is the big picture, of course. Here is the event. This is how God works. But I wonder whether I could press it home into our own lives, make it a more personal application. I wonder whether you know the work of the Holy Spirit in your own life. I wonder whether you feel your life as dry bones and whether you call out to God. You long for him to pour out his Holy Spirit, to breathe life into you. I wonder whether, as we have looked at these verses and your heart has burned within you, longing for his presence, longing for his power. Well, that is a mark of the Spirit at work in you, isn't it? That he is making you alive. You want this. Well, pray that he would continue to make you alive. That you may see him in all his beauty and draw you to you and draw you to him. But also... As a wider community, are we willing for God to work by his Holy Spirit? Are we longing for God to be present here 
and with his fire to destroy our sin and our idols. To be a people who love purity, love repentance, seek after God with a great longing. Are we willing to be a missionary church, to be a source of blessing to others, filled with the Spirit so we want to speak about the amazing works of God? That we would want to give our time, our, our lives, our treasures for this end. To be part of the purpose of God in these last days, to join with the people of God through the ages and through the power of the Holy Spirit, creating a new community so they with us will stand one day before Jesus Christ with those from every nation and we will cry out together, salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Or may we be a people like that. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can remember the day when you sent your Holy Spirit, the dawn of a new era. Thank you that you supernaturally breathe, breathe life into our dead lives. May we grow in obedience and faith, declaring the wonders of God to those around us. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a final hymn now. And it's a wonderful old hymn that expresses the truth of Pentecost. O breath of life, come sweeping through us. Let's sing together.